Welcome to HSBC Build and Grow, a series that focuses on managing finance for business continuity. As financial stakes center stage in business continuity conversations, your story together with HSBC is proud to present this series, featuring some of the finest minds in the ecosystem to help businesses leverage the financial ingenuity, perspective, and insights from these experts to power their own journey their own continent. Amisha, very excited to be talking to you. And you know, one thing which I found you have said somewhere is that you have instituted this four core principles at Zivame. Innovation anywhere and everywhere, customer obsession, impact, one team, one voice, one vision. This is very, very powerful. <laughs> tell us, tell us about this. Like, and, and how has it manifested in the culture within your team at Zivame? I think, uh, Shraddha, it's been a two-year journey now uh, at Zivame. And uh, when I kind of came in, uh, the idea was to sort of uh, look at the space and see how do we scale this. As you know, that this category has been quite a... Uh, it's been an interesting category, has gone through a significant transformation uh, in the last few years, right? Uh, it's been ridden with its own uh, challenges or rather in the past, I don't know if you've heard, but a lot of people when I came and asked me, Amisha, will there ever be a brand that crosses the 200 crore mark in this category, right? So there has been uh, some of those very intrinsic challenges. And as I, uh, you know, sort of uh, started this journey, um, uh, the, the four core principle kind of came out of the, uh, from, a, from a context, which I'll talk about. It was, uh, when we looked at the space, right, I started defining, you know, what are we really solving for? What are we doing here? Uh, Zivame had gone through a couple of pivots by then, right? I mean, we started as a marketplace, moved into this whole uh, price point, sort of private label, fashion-oriented structure. And the idea was to kind of now build a brand. And as we looked at the consumer pain points, as we defined uh, what was the challenge with the category, uh, it was extremely important to kind of uh, sort of get the organization to hone in and focus. Uh, and it was, a, it was a very interesting mix. Now, if you see the world has got e-tailers who are doing a great job and the world has got brands that were doing a great job. And here we were aspiring to be both. Yeah. And, uh, and hence, it was extremely important that we kind of defined our, define our value system, define who are we and what we stand for. And this kind of came out of that, right? Um, and so uh, as we began a journey, we sort of set up our vision. We decided that, you know, this is where we're going to go. And we actually reorganized ourselves in a big way. So about two years ago, we sort of went through a massive transformation internally as well to set up the organization for sort of, uh, you know, looking at the scale and, you know, at some level aspiring to be a billion dollar brand. That's where we realized that the one thing, uh, the three pain points is, as we started to, you know, solve towards the first one that the category faced was um, a shopping experience issue, right? And which is what Zivame was about, right? Uh, we were solving for uh, getting, giving the consumer a great shopping experience, but it was not just about getting the offline to online, right? It was about, uh, all, uh, it was a lot to do with how do we change her journey? And, uh, you know, that was the first part of it. The second uh, was uh, the ecosystem that had been built was been, had been optimized. The manufacturers, retailers had optimized the ecosystem uh, predominantly for uh, that ecosystem rather than the consumer. So in all of this, the consumer was not winning, right? If you saw there were these black and white and beige colored bras that were available, not many sizes available. But, uh, you know, so what you saw was a lack of innovation, lack of product uh, in the market. And that's the other thing that we realized with our data, right? And the third thing was about uh, communication. There was just a clear lack of communication about how she can shop, uh, what she can sort of, you know, find, where can she find it? The conversations were missing, right? And that's more to do with our societal fabric. So these are the three things that the category was kind of, you know, the, the challenge that was there. One needed to solve all of three, all of these three to really succeed, right? Um, so the four code principles sort of came about with saying that, look, everything we do, um, we will innovate. Everything that we look at, everything that we touch, uh, we're going to think about how do we do it differently, right? And uh, how do we do it better? How do we make it more effective? So when it came to merchandise, right, uh, we built products which were uh, really fit for the Indian market. Uh, you will find one of the most innovative, um, lightest products, uh, you know, in this, in, in this space uh, that we built, which is a miracle bra. So it was a lot to do with product innovation there. Second thing was, you know, innovate in anything and everything we do was also about the technology 
the platform that we were building, right? Uh, we were solving a big problem of uh, how do we ensure that uh, we give her and enable her uh, to get the right fit in an in a in a virtual world, right? Without measuring herself, and we developed our fit code, uh, fit code two point where she doesn't have to actually measure herself. Um, again, that was again a sort of grounded in innovation, right? So that was that was one of them. Um, the the second one is um, the idea of uh, bringing that whole agility, the nimbleness back into the organization. Uh, you know, as we kind of look towards our vision, the idea was that anything that we do, let's make sure that we are focused on the impact we bring, right? So let's say that you're trying to set up a store, right? What are you here? To, what are you here to do? Think about what is the impact to the consumer. Think about how do we sort of improve their um, uh, experience right and the third is in all of this in all of what we're doing how do we obsess about the consumer how do we think of her uh, and it was absolutely critical because uh, like i said earlier uh, the one acknowledgement acknowledgement or realization we had is that the reason this category hadn't grown the way it had grown was all along this category was built in a way that it was optimized for the people in the value chain and not for the consumer in all of this the consumer wasn't winning and we wanted to kind of make sure that I wanted to ensure that the, that the focus of the organization was uh, towards the consumer. Um, and last but not the least, uh, it was we were embarking on a journey um, which, uh, you know, which was which was very, very, very unique. Uh, like I told you, not many, many organizations do best of both the worlds. Right. I'm going to be a great retailer. I'm going to be a great brand. And hence, it was imperative to build a culture. Uh, it was absolutely important that we all worked as a team. It uh, and hence this this core motto of one team, one voice. Uh, we kind of added one more thing at the end of it, which was one vision. Um, so all of us were kind of working towards one goal, and the goal was to ensure that she was successful. The goal was to ensure that at the end of all of this, the the Indian woman should find uh, her lingerie, her fit, and should be able to find that fit and comfort. So, you know, as I talk about uh, fit and comfort and, you know, a lot of people kind of say that, hey, you know, it's a garment. Uh, the one challenge I've seen in this category, Shada, is that um, the context and the understanding of why this, uh, this piece of garment is so important for her. Uh, the understanding of um, what does it take to build the right laundry for her? And the understanding of that, what does it do to her at a personal level, the confidence that it gives her when she starts her day with the right piece of garment. Um, and I, I think sort of that is the core of this, right? We needed to make sure that the consumer wins. So anyways, yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of the, the context behind sort of putting these four things um, in front of us as an organization and uh, putting ourselves uh, on an accelerated growth path. Today, we are the uh, number one uh, direct-to-consumer brand. Uh, we are a one-stop destination for her. Um, it's it's a great place to be. I think looking back two years, uh, you know, the team has achieved a significant amount. But we are just it just feels like the tip of the iceberg. Uh, there's a long yeah. way to. No, but phenomenal, Amisha. What you've done is uh, really phenomenal, and especially because we have been observant participants and you know looking at Zivame like over the years and then that brings me to the question like somewhere the role that you played in Zivame is I think very powerful it has created impact I want to understand from you you know you came from outside you you were not the founder of Zivame and then and, and that's why this whole thing where you created this one team one vision uh, goal is so powerful yeah one voice and 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 creating that commanding that kind of a presence within the company taking the brand uh, to the next level i think it would i i can just imagine what a journey you would have made just tell us what does it mean to come and head a company which you've not started and and take it to where it is, your own personal learnings, your own personal, you know, things that you've done, because this is exciting, this is new, for whatever reasons, this is very different, right? Like, uh, yeah. uh, it, yeah, and, and it's also very hard, and that's why it's very hard. Uh, mm -hmm. But you've done that. So tell us, from your uh, last two years, what does it mean? I just say, I think it's been a very fulfilling journey. Um, uh, it's been exciting and, um, you know, for a second, um, I think that thought of, um, not 
owning the company uh, hasn't crossed my mind. It, I think uh, from from the very beginning, um, uh, it, it's it, it's it's my baby, right? I mean, if I think about it, because um, when I took over, um, a lot of great work had been done. You know, by then I think uh, Zivame had a certain place. Um, Zivame started as a marketplace uh, to solve for one of the very key problems, right? Um, and uh, by then there was a second big realization that look, um, there aren't many products in the market that we can sell on our marketplace. And so this whole private label strategy had kind of come in, which was a price point led strategy. Um, you know, it actually, uh, it was kind of peeling the layers of the onion, right? So if I look at, uh, look at this company, right? It was, it was a very different uh, uh, sort of a, a very different organization before, right? And um, I just want to kind of pause here before I jump into the question and answer your question about uh, my journey, right? It's important to understand that this this business, this company is not like, and I've run a, a few other businesses before. So this company and this category is not like any other category. You know, what, the one big realization, right? To be honest, when I took over, it was a job of like, we are going to transform this, we're going to grow this, we're going to, you know, it's go, it's go, it, the mandate was to kind of, build it as a brand and you know to transform the company um only as you enter it i realized this was actually ridden with a lot of challenges and the challenges were not internal to the company alone it was a big uh, external uh, challenge which was more to do with how um, multiple forces of the society had kind of come together to sort of impact the way this category had grown so i would say before prior to zivame days right um it was almost a flat growth for this category, right? You saw that a lot of players in the market in different parts, uh, you know, and you saw that the category was growing flat. Well, Zivame came in and solved for the first challenge, which is the shopping experience that I talked about earlier, right? Um, I think it was a big deal for an Indian woman. Uh, you know, they solved for the convenience, the returns, the, the non-judgmental shopping, so to say, you know, to kind of uh, solve for a lot of those things. I, like I said, in the process, this understanding of that there is a lack of product in the market. Um, so the second step kind of was taken. Now you have to imagine our organization built for marketplace uh, sort of a model, still trying to buy product and, you know, sort of doing some level of buying, right? Um, but was actually built with the thinking of marketplace, right? And when you start thinking of a brand, it's a very different ball game, right? You have to think product, you think concept, you talk about your inspiration, what does the brand stand for? Who are we? All of those things, right? So when I took over, um, I was basically taking an organization that was kind of built for some way different um, uh, reasons, right? And all great because they were solving and peeling the onion of this category, right? And so the idea now was to, how do we now take this to, which already has a very solid base, how do we sort of take it forward? Um, it's been, uh, it's been a it's been one of those journeys where I had to kind of pause and say that, oh my God, I'm going to have to sort of, uh, in, in a moment, you're like, I'm going to have to relook at this, right? So it felt like a clean slate. The reason I say it's my baby is because um, it, it was a clean slate. And I remember having the conversation with the board and uh, I have to, you know, all credit to them. They said, Amisha, do what it takes, but let's build the best brand out there. Let's build the best company out there, right? And that meant a lot. Um, it has been, uh, it was a great journey uh, because I think it needed some hard calls and the first uh, six months were tough. Uh, you know, sort of re-looking at the, at the brand, re-articulating the brand was one big thing we did, right? If you saw that we went through a transformation in the brand logo, we went through, we talked about that we are an all-inclusive brand. We're not the Victoria's Secret of uh, India, which I think Zivami was talked about as before. We're not that. We're exactly the other end of it. We're an inclusive brand. We're here to solve things for an Indian woman uh, where she doesn't feel judged. She feels included. She feels part of it, right? Uh, it's a sisterhood of sorts. Uh, so sort of sort of setting that brand vision and then aligning the organization was an absolute imper uh, imperative thing to do, um, which meant really hard calls. And uh, so went through that. Um, uh, the only thing I will say is there were a lot of people in the organization who was who were believers and passionate about the brand and about the cause. And the reason I say it's a cause because um, as we work through it day in and day out, it's we're not selling bras we are selling a solution for her which she which 85 90 percent of the women have never even realized yeah. that uh, it's uh, that they've been wearing the wrong bra size right and um, it's uh, if i tell you for example if i tell another woman that hey you know what is it there's a chance that you are wearing the wrong bra size most of us wouldn't even accept it 
Yeah. Like, yeah, that 85% must be somebody else, right? Yeah. But you know, over years, she finds herself that her straps are digging, there's a black mark on her shoulders, black mark around her chest, there's this, this um, you know, maybe numbness in her fingers that has come in and she's thinking it's age, it's something else. No, it's your brow, right? So um, sort of focusing the organization for the, re- uh, you know, and ensuring that the realization of what we're doing. Um, and the realization that it's actually a big cause. And, uh, you know, we are a 50% men and women organization today, which I'm very proud of. Uh, extremely, uh, you know, sort of a organization that's very, very diverse. And uh, it's just perfect uh, for, from that perspective. And uh, you find the men in our organization equally passionate about it. Right. So for me, that part of the journey has been very, very fulfilling. For me, building this team that has done such a phenomenal job. They have kind of embraced the vision and just we've gone after it. We've grown 3x uh, in, uh, in, in less than two years. We've expanded all our metrics. We, you know, we've built a very solid business in terms of profitability, in terms of our unit economics, and also a back-end organization that is uh, building products based on data learning, consumer understanding, and hence aligning the supply chain. So I think a lot of things that we've achieved um, but I, I think all of this kind of goes, the credit goes back to that one team, one vision, one voice, uh, you know, so I think my job was just to kind of put that vision in place and uh, put the right people in place and uh, also sort of, you know, empower them, ensure that they believe uh, they have the right to build and grow this. And so today, if you look at the team, you will not uh, feel that it is not the founding team. This team performs like a founding team. This team owns the company as the, a founding team. You know, when you give this answer, I'm like just so impressed because yes, it is the team, it is the people, and you know, it's it 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 takes a team to win, and yeah. but it also takes a leader, and you have been a very strong, phenomenal leader, and you have to embrace that. Amisha, I wanted to ask. There's this news, right, uh, about Zivame, which all of us have read and heard that Reliance has taken 15% of stake, right? They bought uh, uh, Ronnie Screwwaller's stake. Uh, what does it mean uh, for the company just because it's all over the news? What does it mean? Because there's more news around it, right? That there might be a hundred percent buyout. Tell us if you can share something on those. Uh, Shraddha, I think what is uh, what is exciting is, is that in two years, uh, we have a lot of people who are interested. And these are probably, you know, uh, from a from an investor based perspective, people who sort of wondered whether this category could ever see more than 200 crores. Yeah. Um, also, uh, which is which is uh, extremely heartening, extremely exciting. Um, uh, you know, and uh, we believe, and our uh, you know our board also believe that Zivame has a, a huge runway. Um, and as I spoke to you earlier, I th- our vision is to be that one billion dollar brand, right? We got a lot of, a lot of interest uh, from strategics. So as this at this point in time, like you said, um, you know um, that there is a fifteen percent stake that Reliance has taken. Um, uh, that's what has been in the news. I guess the only thing I can say is that um, you know they were quite interested and they wanted to kind of make sure that they're part of the journey, and um, so they've taken that stake uh, as a secondary transaction. But we're tracking on our path. It's a it's a company that is still chasing its goal. We are still wildly going after our grow our goal to grow even this year, um, uh, in in the current scenario. So uh, nothing changes from us for, uh, for us uh, from that that perspective. Uh, it just gives us a lot of confidence that um, you know even in these times you have uh, you have people looking to uh, you know wanting to buy out a secondary and uh, you know are sort of looking to invest in Zivame. And I think that's the only takeaway I have out of this. You know, we can't not be talking to you and, 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 and take from you this understanding of the Indian consumer, because there's been so many things written about the way uh, women purchase, the way they interact with this product. Tell us what has been your observations about the Indian consumer when it comes to purchasing lingeries. I think the, the one thing I would say is the Indian consumer is extremely, extremely smart. Hmm. Um, you know, extremely discerning, uh, very aware. Um, but when it comes to this category, the awareness is only contained uh, or is within the space of the friend or the sister or the aunt that you might have. 
Um, so while she's she's really good at saying whether I should buy it, and she has a solid gut sense of you know whether this is the right value for me, um, what to buy has been something um, that uh, that is that is generally missing for this category because. Um, we've never been exposed. I've met a lot of educated women uh, sitting in high profile jobs today. And uh, you'll be surprised when um, they tell me that Amisha, we thought the brass was always supposed to be uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> and um, So, you know, sort of we're starting from there, you know, as far as the understanding is concerned. So on one end, she's extremely savvy in terms of what she wants and, uh, and how much she's going to, uh, you know, what's the value, right, that she puts. Um, but on the other end, what we find is there is a gap, right? And uh, for this, one has to kind of go deeper into the societal fabric. You'll be surprised rather that even today I find women, um, and again, I will say income and education has um, no bearing on this. Um, highly educated, uh, extremely well uh, to do families, women are still sort of, uh, in the zone of that, you know, bra will be uncomfortable, right? On the other hand, um, you have women who have, uh, who understand, and that's a very small percentage, who have, who understand this category, who know what to buy, because they've been buying this from outside India for years. Uh, yeah. You know, their fathers or uncles or aunts would come in, uh, you know, go out and come in and they would buy from outside, right? So it's a very interesting sort of mix, right? And um, so what we find is that we have a big job in front of us. We have a a huge task of educating uh, from uh, from just the space perspective, right? And uh, uh, helping her understand that what is right for her. And, you know, as I was telling you earlier, you know, we're, we are a brand that is inclusive, that is about her. We want her to sort of just be herself when she comes to our platform. We don't want her to mm. sort of say that, oh, I looked at that beautiful model and um, <laughs> you know, that perfect body and I, I'm going to, uh, well, I want that, but I, I don't know maybe it doesn't look good on me, I'm not going to try it, right? Or, yeah. uh, or we don't want her to feel that, look, that's the only way to go about things. So I think from a uh, consumer perspective, um, what we are trying to do at this point in time is uh, ensure that she understands the nuances, right? What is the functional benefit? What is the um, comfort and the emotional benefit around it? Uh, what, what, is, what is it that, uh, how do, can she pair it, right? How can she make sure that she gets the look that she wants because her the way she she puts her lingerie on, the what she wears, determines her outwardly confidence, her outwardly look. A simple thing like a line showing out of a t-shirt uh, doesn't give you that much confidence. Uh, rather, a seamless look on your uh, kurta or a t-shirt sort of gives you that confidence. To, you know, when you talk to people. So, from an Indian consumer perspective, I think to uh, to just answer your question, she, uh, like I said, I think extremely good at sort of figuring out what to buy, but at the same time. Uh, there's a lot of handholding required as a friend, uh, you know, and we want to be that friend to her who can provide her that information about her, what to buy, how to buy, etc. Uh, Amisha, if you can talk about this, that 90% plus of Zivami's business comes from its own brand store, 80% of, of your business is online, and a good chunk of your revenue is coming from tier two and tier three cities. This is very significant, yeah. right? So, so, and it's very diverse. So tier two, tier three, uh, tell us, like, and then how do consumers get, how do they get to know about you? I think a lot of it has to do with the word of mouth, I would say, because uh, the kind of inbound we get from some of these tiers and uh, the kind of inbound queries we get even from the trade outlets, right? Like uh, when our Sari Shipware video went out, we got like, uh, we got, um, you know, overnight that uh, we got more than, uh, uh, not overnight, but in, in about eight, 10 months without even pushing the video, we got more than uh, sort of 80 to 100 million views, right? Now, uh, some of this has led to inbound queries uh, from even trade outlets, which are in the tier three, tier four zones, right? They want to carry a product. Similarly, um, I think, uh, so consumers are sort of consuming some of this content uh, that we put out there. Um, at the same time, a lot is also to do with the word of mouth, right? If, if I try a sari shipwear, I'm probably going to tell my mom or my uh, sister that, you know, I like this product. Why don't you sort of try it? So mm. what we're realizing is with this category, that first inner circle, right? That, that main core circle of influence that you have is, uh, is where we sort of start seeing that people are, uh, you know, coming into the fold. Uh, but the second big effort is from the brand's perspective. 
and uh, we've been uh, at it when i was talking to you earlier about the conversations we are trying to build right or the information that we are trying to put together for her so that she can um, you know she can find a, a way to shop i think the video content that we put out that on a, uh, on a regular basis literally in a month you'll probably see us put out anywhere between 8 to 10 videos um you know we put a, we work a lot on blogs we work on some of the other social content so i think a lot of it has to do with the the conversation uh, we're having with the consumers we've also done some work in vernacular we've seen a good offtake on that so you know we see that there is there is there's some like uh, like uh, to that as well uh, to the question on uh, tier 2 tier 3 um what we are realizing is that uh, that there's a lot more to do in tier 1 uh and tier 2 tier 3 so we've not gone about uh sort of pushing very hard in terms of marketing in the in the tier 2 tier 3 right but we're still getting a pull from there but at the same time i feel that there's so much more potential to sort of uh, push in tier 1 as well right and um, so again i think it all, it's all pointing to the fact that there is a real need uh women are looking to find a platform that is comfortable to them where they can shop and uh, you know we sort of see people shopping from all the spaces um at the end of the day uh, what i see right now is, is we're in a great place we're in a place where from a fundamentals from a business model from the unit economics perspective we are um, you know we are on a very solid break even path uh, and uh, which is a beautiful place to be because now it's all going to be about how do we go scaling this right we we've kind of done our job we've done the clean up that we wanted we are houses you know we're ready we're ready to welcome her and so the next phase is the next two years you'll just see us uh, push the pedal okay before we end you are on money matters so i want to mm-hmm. ask you what does money what has money meant to you personally i think money has meant different things at different stages um uh, i i personally believe that um, money is an equation uh, you know where a um, couple of different variables come in right it's your risk appetite it's your life stage it's how you're seeing your next 5 to 10 years um so for me personally um you know i it it has meant very different things and um Uh, it's it's about uh, you know do you want to use a lot of people would probably use money um to buy something to you know because it makes them happy or they want to invest in something so um i think my personal philosophy is uh, sort of you know pause evaluate where you are what is it that you want to do um you know as a family uh, you know what is our risk appetite today uh, where do you where do we see ourselves in the next 10 years and sort of invest or save accordingly right i think um, i personally believe that everybody should have their own philosophy around money i wouldn't uh, recommend anybody uh, t- taking something prescribed by me or anybody else um, because only you know your circumstances right um, i've seen people who wanted to save um, for 2 3 years because they wanted to uh, build their own business have their own startup and i think that's a great thing to do so uh, while on the other end people say that look i have two years of my life i'm going to go out and you know spend all of it and travel and you know enjoy uh, myself and sort of uh, because that's what is going to make me happy so i think um, like i said i think the journey and the relationship with money i believe changes um, from time to time and uh, that's been the case with us as well yeah cool cool thank you so much amisha really very inspiring talking thank to you, you.